Approximately 1 in 7 American adults have chronic kidney disease, and the prevalence is higher in those with metabolic risk factors, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity. That sounds like a job for plant-based diets, which have demonstrated significant utility for the prevention and treatment of all three of those modern-day scourges of society. Their utility for the treatment of so many diseases has led to a growing interest in their applicability for the prevention and treatment of chronic kidney disease itself. In theory, there are multiple benefits of more plant-based diets in the management of kidney disease. The intake of animal fat is associated with protein loss in the urine, and other components related to meat, such as choline and carnitine, are converted by bad gut bugs into TMAO, which is associated with scarring of the kidneys. Plant-based diets carry a decreased acid load, whereas ingestion of animal-based foods like meat, eggs, and dairy increases the formation of acid and ammonia, unlike the favorable alkalization from fruits and vegetables. The phosphorus in plant-based protein is less absorbable, which is a good thing if you have ailing kidneys, especially compared to the added phosphorus-based preservatives that are often used in meat processing. Indeed, you can successfully lower blood phosphorus levels in kidney disease patients in as short as one week on a vegetarian diet. High dietary fiber intake can also pull advanced glycation end products out of your system, those so-called glycotoxins, and prevent constipation, which can cause potassium overload in kidney patients. A plant-based diet also lessens the likelihood of exposure to potassium-based additives. A lot of the phosphorus additives in meat are also potassium additives. And finally, there may be favorable impacts on the gut microbiome, leading to lower generation of uremic toxins. Such putrefaction products are generated by protein putrefying in the gut, but plant-rich dyes may be able to reduce uremic toxins in part due to increased fiber and lower protein intakes. The lower the dietary protein intake, the slower the progression towards end-stage kidney disease, and the increased risk of progression to end-stage kidney disease associated with dietary protein intake appeared to have no threshold, meaning it just seemed the lower the better. But even if you just drop your protein intake by just like 10 grams a day, that modest reduction may decrease the risk of end-stage renal disease and death by greater than 50%. Um, that's incredible. It was a randomized control trial. They were trying to get people down to like 0.6 grams per kilogram a day of protein, which is like 40 grams a day, but could only get people down to about 60 grams a day, which is technically not even a low-protein diet. The recommended protein intake is 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, or like 50 grams a day. But just getting people from the usual protein intake of like 70 grams down to 60 cut their risk of dialysis or death by 77%. Check this out. By the end of four years, more than 25% of those in the usual diet group were either dead or on dialysis from end-stage disease. In the reduced protein group, it was less than 10%. A randomized control trial proving massive benefit, yet despite Despite strong scientific evidence, many doctors are still unconvinced that a low-protein diet can help patients with chronic kidney disease. Why? The reasons for this nihilism are unclear, but could be related to insufficient background knowledge, lack of interest in nutrition and dietetics, and limited familiarity with the most recent scientific literature. Although it's known that plant-based foods are important for physical health, less is known about the relationship between plant-based foods and cognitive health. Now, in terms of preventing Alzheimer's and other forms of actual dementia, there's data that those who consume meat, including poultry and fish, have two to three times the risk of developing dementia compared with vegetarians. But what about just like day-to-day -day function? Greater adherence to a more plant-based dietary pattern was related to better performance on all cognitive tasks researchers measured. One possible mechanism that could have been thought to underlie the results is body weight. I mean, plant-based diets reduce BMI, and lower BMI has been associated with better cognitive function, but they still found a connection between more plants and better brain function, even after controlling for weight. Another possible mechanism linking diet and cognition is inflammation. That's how saturated fat impairs the memory of lab rats, through brain inflammation. And since fiber can be anti-inflammatory and meat pro-inflammatory, that may help explain some of the effects of plant-based diets on health and cognition. The saturated fat connection appears to extend to human cognition. 
A systematic review and meta-analysis covering nine studies found that increased saturated fat intake, which is found mostly in meat, dairy, and junk, was associated with a 40% increased risk of cognitive impairment and nearly 90% higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. So wait, does that mean if you put people on a low-carb diet, it impairs their brain function? Yes, it does. A high-fat diet not only impairs the heart, but also cognitive function. Men were randomized to just five days of a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet, or a lower-fat diet, and on the low-carb diet, cognitive tests showed they suffered impaired attention, speed, and mood. Again, just within days. Conclusion, raising the level of fat in your blood not only decreased energy production in the heart, but reduced cognition, which suggests that a high-fat diet is detrimental to the heart and brain. Now, they were thinking the impaired energy production may have accounted for the brain dysfunction as well, but oral glycotoxins may also link high-fat eating with a loss of cognitive capacity. Glycotoxins, also known as advanced glycation end products, or AGEs, are a class of oxidant stress-promoting agents, free radical-promoting agents, implicated in diabetes and aging, including brain injury due to Alzheimer's disease and stroke. The development of Alzheimer's disease in the first place is thought to involve the accumulation of these AGEs, which encourage the formation and deposition of the two hallmarks of Alzheimer's, neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques in the brain discovered on autopsy. But it's not just full-blown dementia. Evidence suggests AGEs contribute to cognitive decline in general. Dietary advanced glycation end products are associated with a decline in memory, and since modifying the levels of AGEs in the diet may be relatively easy, these preliminary results suggest a simple strategy to diminish cognitive compromise. What are the major sources of dietary AGEs to stay away from? Meat, cooked using high dry heat, such as in broiling, grilling, frying, and roasting. From my video, The Best Diet for Healthy Aging, here is the list of all the most AGE-contaminated foods. AGEs are not only associated with getting Alzheimer's in the first place, but also the progression of Alzheimer's disease, as well as lower cognitive performance in general, as tracked, interestingly enough, via skin autofluorescence. AGEs have a natural fluorescence that you can pick up using a special detector, enabling a simple, non-invasive assessment of advanced glycation end product accumulation in the body. The more meat you eat, the more the AGE skin autofluorescence you get, which then correlates with cognitive impairment. In fact, one of these days, these fluorescent scanners may be included in routine medical checkups. Since meat is the main high AGE food, it should be no surprise that AGE skin autofluorescence measurements are significantly lower in those eating more plant-based. So the data suggests reduction of food-derived AGEs is feasible and may provide an effective treatment strategies for our epidemics of Alzheimer's and metabolic disease. In my video on antibiotic-resistant genes, I explored how more were found in the guts of those who eat meat, dairy, and eggs than those who eat completely plant-based. But does the transfer of bacteria from animal foods in the human gut result in differences in actual clinical outcomes, other than food poisoning, of course? Uh, Foodborne bacteria sicken about 350 million people every year. Most of that can be traced to meat, dairy products, and eggs. Besides food poisoning, though, what about extra-intestinal infections, infections outside the digestive tract, for example, due to pathogenic and antibiotic-resistant E. coli from retail chicken breasts? Infections where, though? The urinary tract. There's a type of E. coli called ST131, which is a foodborne uropathogen, meaning it causes urinary tract infections, most of which are just bladder infections, which typically amount to a little more than a painful annoyance, but can become invasive and spread up into the kidneys and invade the bloodstream and end your life. E. coli ST131 emerged explosively in the last 20 years or so to become the most important multidrug-resistant uropathogen in circulation today. Urinary tract infections are caused principally by ascending E. coli infection via an intestine-stool-urethra route, 
meaning these E. coli that cause UTIs, called extraintestinal pathogenic E. coli, or XPEC bacteria, start out in the colon, make it to the anus, and then make their way up into the urethra, then into your bladder. How do they get into your intestines in the first place? That's where the chicken comes in. The role of poultry meat can be to introduce the XPEC bacteria, allowing it to colonize the rectums of consumers lying in wait until an opportunity to cause infection presents itself. For example, thrusting from sexual intercourse can introduce the bacteria into the urethra. The time lag between human XPEC acquisition in the intestine and the bladder infection has been the fundamental challenge linking the two. But we now have strong evidence that a substantial portion of the ST131 strains infecting humans originate from poultry. But they couldn't tell whether any single infection arose from direct exposure to contaminated poultry, or indirectly from chicken meat from human-to-human -human transmission from, say, a partner who ate some contaminated poultry. What percentage of human UTIs arise from poultry. Now, researchers analyzed E. coli isolates from urine samples from patients with suspected UTIs, and compared them to the bacteria on retail meat samples in the same region using DNA fingerprinting techniques. They found that about a fifth of E. coli isolates from suspected cases of UTIs belong to types found in local retail poultry. 21% might not sound like a lot, but E. coli UTIs are one of the most common infectious diseases in the United States, affecting approximately 7 million women, so contaminated chicken may result in more than a million UTIs in American women every year. This may explain why women infected with multidrug-resistant E. coli reported more frequent chicken consumption, putting them at nearly four times the odds, though frequent consumption of Pork was also a risk factor. Wait, is it found in pigs too? Human XPEC, those extraintestinal E. coli that cause UTIs, have also been identified on pig farms, in pigs, and in retail pork meat, albeit at considerably lower levels than in poultry or chicken meat. So chicken is riskiest, uh, pork less so, and beef could be considered the safest from a UTI standpoint, since cattle don't appear to be a reservoir of these particular types of E. coli. OK, well, if meat, including poultry and pork, is the major reservoir for these UTI bacteria, then vegetarians who avoid meat should theoretically suffer less exposure. However, no study thus far has examined whether vegetarian diets reduce the risk of UTIs until now. A prospective study on the risk of urinary tract infection in vegetarians versus non-vegetarians. Well, if around 20% are tied to retail chicken meat, no surprise that eating vegetarian is associated with around 20% lower risk of UTIs, particularly in women. And this association was independent of diseases and predisposing risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, and high cholesterol, meaning it's not just due to the fact that vegetarians had less diabetes or something. What about buying organic chicken? Bacteria swabbed from chicken labeled organic harbored less antibiotic-resistant bacteria, but no no less likely to be contaminated with XPEC UTI bacteria. Uh, these findings suggest that retail chicken products in the United States, even if they're labeled organic, pose a potential health threat to consumers because they're contaminated with extensively antibiotic-resistant E. coli, including the ones that cause UTIs. To date, only the jack-in-the-box E. coli, like 0157H7, are considered food adulterants, meaning it's not legal to knowingly sell contaminated meat. Why don't they do the same with the XPEC bugs? Now that there's such strong evidence they're infecting so many women? Well, in a survey of retail chicken breasts collected widely across the United States, 14.3% of the E. coli they found appeared to be XPEC. Given that E. coli can be found in about 90% of retail turkey and chicken products, that would mean the industry would have to dump literally billions of pounds of chicken breasts every year. Theoretically, bathing your muscles in an alkaline environment should enable faster acid removal from muscle cells, delaying the muscle fatigue that's due to the buildup of lactic acid in the muscle. Given these buffering effects, no wonder sodium bicarbonate in other words, baking soda, has been found to have such significant ergogenic or performance-enhancing effects on muscular endurance. 
The problem with loading with baking soda is that it frequently causes severe gastrointestinal distress, and at standard doses you could easily take in twice the recommended upper daily limit of sodium in just that one load. Therefore, what about a low-acid diet, which focuses on high intakes of fruits and vegetables? That may be an attractive alternative to bicarbonate loading for improving anaerobic exercise performance, meaning short burst activity like sprinting. Today's diets are acid-forming, meaning higher in animal foods with fewer vegetables and fruits, whereas in general the alkaline-promoting diet is centered around whole plant foods with few processed foods and less meat, dairy, and eggs, which are accepted as acid-forming foods. Although alkalizing chemicals, such as sodium bicarbonate, have been shown to consistently improve performance, alkalizing diets do not demonstrate the same effect. A review of 10 studies that investigated the effect of high versus low dietary acid loads on athletic performance did not find consistently improved exercise performance at maximal or submaximal exercise intensities. However, maybe they just didn't go alkaline enough. For example, in this study, they had people eat more fruits and vegetables and less meat, cheese, cereals, and eggs, but saw no difference in any performance-related parameters. But a sufficiently alkaline diet is characterized by the production of alkaline urine, a pH of P at least 7 or higher. If you look at what the participants achieved, most failed to meet the benchmark, so their diet may just not have been alkaline-forming enough. In this study, showing enhanced 400-meter sprint performance, they were able to swap out enough meat, eggs, cheese, and cereal products, and swap in enough fruits and vegetables, that they were just barely able to make seven, and they did get a little performance boost, suggesting that it's possible to improve sprint performance by consuming alkalizing natural foods and beverages without the ingestion of baking soda. Thus, an alkalizing diet may be an easy and natural way to enhance performance, However, the performance enhancement was only about 2%, just a few seconds. But check out this study. Same general strategy, more fruits and vegetables, and less the acid-promoting foods, such as meats, cheeses, and refined grains. But they weren't messing around. Six to eight cups of vegetables, plus more than four servings of fruit a day, got their urine up over seven and a 21% performance enhancement. I mean, that's extraordinary. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean it has anything to do with the pH. I mean, they ate more vegetables, which contain dietary nitrates, which alone acutely improve exercise performance. It's possible that nitrates might have enhanced exercise performance during the low-acid trial. However, that would entail extracting more energy from every breath, and they didn't find that. But anytime you make huge changes in people's diets, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what made the critical difference. But these extra benefits are a feature, not a bug. I mean, because a, a more alkaline-forming diet is rich in fruits and vegetables and depleted of many unhealthy foods, a low-acid diet can not only provide exercise performance benefits, but might also reduce chronic disease risk. Any performance benefits in non-athletes? The effect of an alkaline diet on body composition and aerobic exercise performance of sedentary women. A randomized controlled trial swapping in vegetable protein sources like legumes for animal protein sources, and a greater decrease in weight, body fat mass, lactic acid accumulation, and perceived exertion levels, all the while exhibiting a boost in exercise performance duration and VO2 max levels, which is a measure of fitness. Again, pH could just be one of many explanations why eating healthier could make you perform better, but either way, we should recommend athletes of all ages focus on consuming ample amounts of fruits and vegetables, if only to maintain long-term health. Vitamin K. Wait, I know about vitamins A, B, C, D, and E. What happened to vitamins F, G, H, I, and J? It's not alphabetical. Vitamin K stands for coagulation, or at least it does in German. That's the fundamental role vitamin K plays, helping the blood to clot. But over the last few decades, there's evidence that it has other roles in the health of our bones, heart, and brain. Kind of reminds me of vitamin D. I mean, we know vitamin D is important for bone health, but then there's been all sorts of other controversial functions ascribed to it, some of which have been proven and some disproven. What about 
vitamin K. For bone health, for example, is the link between vitamin K and osteoporosis myth or reality? It turns out the findings on vitamin K in bone are conflicting and unclear. It doesn't help that some of the major trials were found to be problematic, to say the least, as in likely fraudulent, containing impossible data, with investigators admitting to complete fabrication. And so if you do a systematic review eliminating any fraud, we find there's no evidence that vitamin K supplementation affects bone mineral density or vertebral fractures. What about the heart? Vitamin K supplementation for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. Uh, there's a vitamin K-activated protein in your blood that binds up excess calcium and helps prevent calcium from being deposited into the walls of your arteries and stiffening them. So if you give people extra vitamin K, will that protect people's arteries from calcification? I mean, it sounds good in theory, but no. Vitamin K does not appear to consistently prevent progression of calcification, atherosclerosis, or arterial stiffness. For example, artery calcification is particularly common in patients with chronic kidney disease, which can lead to increased artery stiffness, which is an important risk factor for heart attacks and strokes. An earlier trial didn't find any benefit on coronary artery calcification between the vitamin K and placebo groups, but they were using kind of a small dose. So these trials use a whopping dose daily for a year, and nada. Vitamin K supplementation did not improve vascular stiffness or other measures of artery health. And in fact, one study on the effect of vitamin K supplementation on artery calcification in patients with diabetes found that calcification tended to increase after supplementation with a type of vitamin K found in a slimy fermented soy food called natto. Now, those with higher levels of vitamin K circulating in their bloodstreams do tend to have lower levels of inflammation, but no wonder. Where is vitamin K found? The predominant dietary form of vitamin K in the human diet comes from dark green leafy vegetables and cruciferous vegetables. So how did people get high levels in their blood? Eating broccoli. Those with higher levels of vitamin K in their blood were eating more vegetables, less meat. No wonder they had lower levels of inflammation. The recommended adequate daily intake for vitamin K is set at 70 micrograms a day in Europe, and between 90 and 120 a day here in the United States. Just two leaves of kale has over 70, and a quarter cup of cooked kale will get anyone all the K they need for the day. Now, there is vitamin K found in meat, dairy, and eggs, averaging about 5 to 10 micrograms per serving. In other words, they are even beaten out by iceberg lettuce, which is mostly water, but still contains like two to three times more vitamin K. Ah, but that's vitamin K1. What's found in animal products is mostly vitamin K2. Do you need K2? Apparently not. Once you get enough plant-based K1, there's no established requirement for K2, because it hasn't been proven that K2 has effects that are different from K1. They both act the same way in the body, thus there's not even enough data to take K2 into account at all. So when the recommended adequate daily intakes are set, they're only talking about getting enough K1 from plants, mostly green vegetables. In fact, most of the bone trials that flopped used the K2 found in animal products, and most of the failed heart studies used K2 as well. OK, even though there's presently a lack of randomized trial evidence to support a beneficial role for vitamin K in preventing the worsening of cardiovascular disease or bone health, what if that were to change? What if all of a sudden K2 was shown to have unique benefits? Well, guess what? The bacteria in your gut make K2. That's why fermented foods have K2. Bacteria make it. And the bacteria in your gut not only make it, but it gets absorbed from your colon up into your system, contributing a significant amount of the human vitamin K requirement, just in case you miss a couple days of greens. Vitamin K1 is made by plants and is the primary dietary form. Then there are a dozen or so types of vitamin K2, which are synthesized by bacteria, including several types in the human gut. The exception, though, is a type of K2 called menaquinone 4, MK4, which is endogenously synthesized in mammals, and therefore is found in animal products. Now, I don't know if any of you noticed, but were mammals too? It has consistently been shown that vitamin K1 from greens is endogenously converted inside your body to the vitamin K2 in animal products. You're made out of meat too.
though it took until 2010 before we discovered the human biosynthetic enzyme that does it. So no reason at all to take any sort of vitamin K supplement. Eat your greens. In fact, when K2 supplements were looked at, researchers found significant problems in terms of contaminants and mislabeling. Eat your greens. Now, K2 appears in higher concentrations in certain tissues, including the brain. Again, we make K2 from the K1 we eat in greens, but maybe extra K2 might help? Well, if we measure vitamin K levels in the blood and brains of centenarians, so those that live over 100, concentrations of circulating K1 from vegetables, but not cerebral K2, not the K2 in the brain, was positively correlated with a wide range of cognitive measures. Why? Likely because they were eating green vegetables, and green vegetables don't just have vitamin K. Green leafy vegetables are the most concentrated source of lutein, the eye health nutrient that's taken up into the brain and is associated with cognitive performance across the lifespan. And so in these centenarians, circulating K1 and lutein concentrations were highly correlated, so it's hard to tease out exactly what in greens was so beneficial. It's like when you see data showing lower circulating K1 levels in the bloodstream are associated with an increased risk of all-cause mortality, meaning lower K1 levels were correlated with a shorter lifespan. Well, duh! K1 is found in greens, and of all the dietary components correlated with all-cause mortality, the best evidence appears to support the intake of green leafy vegetables and salads to reduce all-cause mortality. In other words, eat your greens. Osteoporosis has become a major public health problem worldwide. The morbidity and even mortality of osteoporotic complications, such as hip fractures, are severe. Osteoporosis is diagnosed by testing low in bone mineral density, and afflicts about 1 in 20 men over age 65 and 1 in 4 women. Do we need to be concerned about bone mineral density in vegetarians and vegans? There are studies showing vegetarian-style diets during adolescence can have a positive impact on bone in young adulthood, but what we really want to know is about osteoporosis at older ages. In an earlier video, I talked about a meta-analysis that concluded that vegetarian diets, particularly vegan diets, were associated with lower bone mineral density, but only by a clinically insignificant amount. Given the relationship between fracture risk and bone mineral density, the relative risk of fracture in vegans would only be about 10% higher than in meat eaters, but that doesn't sound very insignificant to me. Uh, now, I talked about how the differences in bone mineral density are largely just a function of vegetarian, and particularly vegans, having such low rates of obesity. Obese individuals are protected from osteoporosis because they do so much weight-bearing exercise, just walking from one room to the next, basically. But we only care about bone mineral density because we care about bone fractures. What's the comparative fracture risk in vegetarians versus non-vegetarians? Now we're talking. Compared with meat eaters, same risk for vegetarians, but a 30% higher risk for vegans. Now it was mostly wrist and arm fractures. There weren't any hip fractures. Wrist fractures are among the most common fractures, and interestingly, occurs typically in women who are in good health and active. It's the kind of fracture you get if you like trip when you run and fall on an outstretched hand. But the 30% increased risk was after controlling for non-dietary factors, including activities such as exercise or an active workplace. The increased risk only disappeared when they controlled for calcium. Vegans only were at higher risk when they got under 525 mg of calcium a day, which is equal to the estimated average requirement. Among those getting at least 525, there was no greater risk, so the higher fracture risk in the vegans appeared to be a consequence of inadequate calcium intake, which is essential for bone health regardless of what kind of diet you eat. You don't need to drink milk. A greater intake of milk and dairy products is not associated with a lower risk of osteoporosis or hip fracture. In fact, every additional cup or so of cow's milk a day was associated with a 9% greater risk of hip fracture in prospective studies. But you do have to get calcium from somewhere. Plant-based sources include almonds, sesame seeds, tofu, calcium-fortified plant milks, or the best sources, dark green leafy vegetables such as kale, uh, basically any dark green leafies except for spinach, beet greens, or chard, which are just stingy with their calcium. 
and most vegans in the study were getting more than the 525. There's lots of healthy foods packed with calcium, but they only work if you actually eat them. But wait, uh, what about the mountain of data showing that dietary calcium intake is not associated with risk of fractures? And there's no evidence that increasing calcium intake prevents fractures, and so increasing calcium intake should not be recommended for fracture prevention. But that's based on giving extra calcium to people who are already getting enough calcium, uh, so it might be like a, a plateau effect. Take women getting only 500 mg of calcium a day, and randomize them to calcium supplements, and you can drop hip fracture rates 40% within 18 months. Now, they also gave them vitamin D, and the women did start out seriously deficient with vitamin D levels down around 15, so it's hard to tease out the effects of calcium versus the D. But vegans who aren't supplementing with D at higher latitudes can dip down that low during the winter months too. Now, there was a study in Shanghai that found comparable bone health despite lower D levels down around 15. They were also low in calcium intake and still had similar bone mineral density. But given that fracture study, I'd recommend people make sure they're getting enough calcium and enough vitamin D. But that fracture study was published in 2007. A 2020 update found a higher risk of fractures even in vegans getting more than 700 mg of calcium a day. What explains that? We'll explore just that question next. As I noted in my video on bone mineral density, vegetarians had slightly lower bone mineral density in their spines. Although the difference was basically within the margin of error for the test, if the bone quality really is compromised, it could lead to uh, collapsed vertebrae, increased spinal fracture risk. There's no evidence for this. The incidence of vertebral fracture was ascertained in older women who had been vegan for most of their lives—34 years on average. And despite their calcium intake being terrible, about half that of the non-vegans, and a quarter of them vitamin D deficient, the incidence of vertebral fractures was not significantly different. Although the vegans had a higher prevalence of vitamin D deficiency and lower dietary calcium intakes, the two factors were not associated with bone loss. In fact, the, the annual loss in bone mineral density in the hips of vegans was less than half that of the meat eaters, though the difference did not reach statistical significance. Vegetarian women had not been found to be at higher risk of any kind of fractures, including wrist fractures in this case, though among vegetarians, those who consumed the least vegetable protein intake were at the highest risk for fracture. Those who ate beans every day, or nuts, or like veggie burgers, only had a third of the wrist fractures compared to vegetarians who only ate beans or other higher protein foods less than three times a week. So those that consume a vegan or vegetarian diet may be at increased risk of fracture unless care is taken to ensure an adequate quantity and variety of foods high in protein, such as whole grains, nuts, and beans, split peas, chickpeas, or lentils are in the diet. That's one of the reasons in my free Daily Dozen app I recommend whole grains and legumes every day. Hip fractures are even more serious. Those eating legumes, like beans every day, reduce their risk of hip fracture by more than 60%, compared to 40% lower risk for meat protein with plant-based meats, coming in in between with about 50% lower risk of hip fractures. What's the bottom line on plant-based diets and bone health, according to this 2020 review? Um, theoretically, a long-term plant-based diet may reduce the risk of osteoporosis, but that has yet to be demonstrated. What we do know is that plant-based diets, when ensuring adequate calcium and vitamin D levels, don't appear to have any detrimental effects on bone health. But this was published August 2020. In November 2020, the 12-year follow-up to the study I talked about in my last video on comparative fracture risk in vegetarians versus non-vegetarians was published, finding that non-meat eaters, especially vegans, had higher risk of total bone fractures, including at sites associated with osteoporosis, such as hip fractures. It comes out to be about 20 more cases in vegans for every 1,000 people over 10 years. So if indeed this is cause and effect, eating vegan, there would be a, an annual 1 in 500 chance of having a bone fracture that you otherwise might not have had. Was it because they weren't eating enough beans? Apparently not, since vegans getting more protein still apparently had higher risk. Maybe it was because they weren't getting enough calcium? Apparently not, since vegans getting more calcium still apparently had higher risk. What about bone and vitamin B12? 
If you remember, Epic Oxford, where the bone data comes from, is the same group of British vegans who had rampant B12 deficiency. More than half the vegans were B12 deficient because they weren't adequately supplementing with B12 or B12-fortified foods. This can lead to high homocysteine levels, which not only increase stroke risk, but may increase the activity of bone-eating cells. This was in a petri dish. But you do indeed see low bone mineral density in those born with a birth defect that leads to high homocysteine levels in the blood. Therefore, high serum homocysteine may be regarded as a factor that can reduce both bone mass and quality, but you don't know until you put it to the test, and homocysteine-lowering treatment failed to reduce the risk of bone fracture. So in the end, the effect of B12 deficiency in bone health remains to be established. OK, so how do we explain the higher fracture rates found among vegans? The investigators conclude that their findings suggest that bone health in vegans requires further research, but there were some clues. The elevated fracture risk, both for total fractures and for hip fractures specifically, was only significant for those under a BMI of 22.5, which is like under about 130 pounds for a woman of average height. So part of the problem is that vegans tend to be so slender on average. Why are overweight and obese individuals protected from fractures? Well, think about it. They have cushioning during a fall. There's more of a cushion on your hips. Also, there's an enzyme in fatty tissue that churns out estrogen, which is why women increase their breast cancer risk a percentage point for every pound they gain in adulthood. But estrogen can also have a bone-preserving effect. Now, you can get the best of both worlds consuming soy foods, preventing bone loss while at the same time associated with lessening breast cancer risk for both estrogen receptor positive tumors and estrogen receptor negative tumors. Finally, overweight and obese individuals may also have stronger bones just from the increased weight bearing. Carrying 100 extra pounds, I mean, you're doing major weight bearing exercise just walking across the room. So the risk difference they saw between vegans and meat eaters were likely at least partially due to the difference in BMI. My money, however, is on vitamin D. Great Britain is at Canadian latitudes. The sun's rays are at such an angle during the winter months up there that the vitamin D levels among British vegans in the wintertime drops down to suboptimal levels. Ideally, we should be up around 75 nanomoles per liter, or 30 nanograms per milliliter, depending on what units you're using, which the vegans nail in the summer. It is the sunshine vitamin after all, but in the winter, not getting the vitamin D added to dairy or found naturally in oily fish, if vegans aren't supplementing at that latitude during the winter, their vitamin D levels may drop too low. Now, randomized controlled trials show that vitamin D alone does not seem to reduce fracture rates, but you know, boosting people's D and calcium at the same time does, so maybe it was a combination of the relatively low D and calcium intakes among the vegans that led to their higher fracture rates. We won't know for sure until it's actually put to the test, and when it is, you can be sure I'll do a video about it cancer prevalence is predicted to continue to increase, but the good news is that between 30 and 50 percent of most common cancers might be preventable through diet and lifestyle changes. Take breast cancer, for example, the most common female internal cancer diagnosis in the United States, and the second leading cause of female cancer death after lung cancer. But there's a growing body of evidence that breast cancer incidence can be reduced with an overall healthy lifestyle which includes a high-quality diet consisting of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes like beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils. Greater adherence to a more Mediterranean-style diet was associated with a lower risk of cancer mortality, including less breast cancer. And an analysis of the individual components of the Mediterranean diet revealed that the protective effects appear to be most attributable to eating more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, contributing to mounting evidence that a plant-based diet is the most beneficial dietary pattern for breast cancer survivors. Wait, the same diet that can help you prevent cancer can also help you survive cancer? That's one of the 10 recommendations from the prestigious American Institute for Cancer Research. After a cancer diagnosis, follow the same recommendations to maintain a healthy weight, exercise, eat a diet rich in four things, whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans, but limit fast food and processed junk, and limit consumption of meats, 
soda, and alcohol. Okay, but does adherence to these guidelines actually translate into less cancer? Yes, substantially reduce the risk of total cancer, providing robust evidence that the guidelines for cancer prevention should be widely disseminated in society. About half the folks were failing in the healthy weight and physical activity departments, but more than 90% were failing on eating enough plant foods or limiting enough meat and processed junk. But I guess the glass 10% full interpretation is that given that many people do not meet the recommendations, there's a great potential for cancer prevention. Specific to breast cancer risk, women who met most of those recommendations only had half the breast cancer risk compared to women who only nailed a couple. If you could only do one of those recommendations, the limiting animal foods seemed most protective. Adherence to the recommendations was also associated with higher survival in cancer patients who already had cancer. This was also true for older female cancer survivors, most of whom were suffering from breast cancer. A good proxy for whole food plant intake is dietary fiber, since it's not found in animal foods and is depleted or completely absent in processed foods. And higher dietary fiber consumption was associated with a 37% lower risk of dying from all causes put together, and 28% lower risk of dying specifically from breast cancer among breast cancer survivors. And it didn't take much. There was like a 10% drop in death risk for every 5 grams a day increment in dietary fiber intake. That's just like a cup of oatmeal or broccoli or a third a cup of beans. A cancer diagnosis may provide a teachable moment for cancer survivors to make positive changes in their health behaviors. Even more importantly, higher fiber intake may help prevent breast cancer in the first place. Yes, fiber could help directly by feeding your good gut flora, which then produce anti-inflammatory compounds, or it could just be an indicator of total whole plant food intake. Adherence to the cancer prevention recommendations isn't just associated with higher survival in cancer patients and lower risk of dying from cancer, but lower risk of dying overall. That's the beauty of eating a more plant-based diet. The same diet that's anti-cancer is also anti-heart disease, and even apparently anti-lung disease. Conclusion, results of the study suggest following the cancer prevention diet and lifestyle recommendations could significantly increase longevity. The cholesterol controversy is over. In in fact, you can argue it was over a century ago. It seemed obvious in 1920 that high cholesterol levels in the blood infiltrating your artery walls was the cause of coronary heart disease, the number one killer of men and women, confirmed as unequivocally as the revelation that blood circulated throughout the body, or, or that the tuberculosis bacteria causes tuberculosis. I've reviewed some of that evidence previously in videos like how do we know that cholesterol causes heart disease, and optimal cholesterol level? The question is, why did it take so long? What is so puzzling is that why we have to work so hard to sell the message, given what seems to be an unbeatable amount of hard evidence. Many rejected the cholesterol heart disease link because so many patients were dying of coronary heart disease despite so-called perfectly normal cholesterol levels. Of course, as I've detailed before, having normal cholesterol levels in a society where it's normal to drop dead of a heart attack isn't exactly saying much. Ideally, we want to get our total cholesterol well under 150, since having high cholesterol levels in your blood is thought of as the only direct atherosclerotic risk factor. All the other things, smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, inactivity, obesity, just exacerbate the damage caused by the high cholesterol. Another factor may be the preoccupation of cardiologists with all the new fancy gadgets and procedures out there. It's like we train them to be highly skilled, high-tech fighter pilots to fight a war, but then sent them on some boring preventive diplomatic mission. But the reasons may be even more personal than that. As an editorial in the Journal of the American Heart Association asked nearly 50 years ago, why do we pretend the cause of heart disease is mysterious? There is no mystery as to why the incidence of heart disease, like that of lung disease and of venereal disease, sexually transmitted disease, continues to rise for many decades after the cause is established. Why? Because human beings, including physicians, are eager for excuses 
not to face annoying facts, and so they continue to do things which are agreeable but hazardous. People tend to reject new ideas even when they don't impose any change in our way of life, and it's almost impossible for most men to accept any suggestion that it might be wise to give up agreeable habits such as smoking, unsafe sex, or eating their favorite foods. This continuing challenge is represented by a a senior professor of medicine who questioned whether an alteration of diet would really affect the course of heart disease. These professors know the facts. The problem is that they, like so many patients, will not allow themselves to believe the message. Eating rich food just means too much to too many people, even when it's our gravest mortal threat. Scientific consensus panels going back decades established beyond a reasonable doubt that lowering LDL cholesterol reduces the risk of heart attacks. Consistent evidence unequivocally establishes that LDL causes our number one killer, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And what raises LDL cholesterol? Saturated fat. And where is cholesterol raising saturated fat found? The number one source is dairy, the number two source is chicken, then pastries, pork, and burgers. And it's not just saturated fat, dietary cholesterol has been known as a dominant factor in the genesis of atherosclerosis since 1908, which is why we should lower our intake of saturated fats, trans fats, and dietary cholesterol as much as possible. This is consistent with how our biology evolved. Extensive evidence clearly indicates that a plant-based diet was the traditional eating pattern of our distant ancestors. And so dietary cholesterol intakes were typically very low, while at the same time we were packing in whole plant foods containing components like fiber to help us eliminate cholesterol. Where is dietary cholesterol coming from now? Overwhelmingly eggs, with a number two source chicken, then beef, dairy, and pork. Uh, so wait a second. If the Institute of Medicine recommends that individuals consume as little dietary cholesterol as possible, uh, presumably that would mean cutting out foods like eggs entirely. But does eating cholesterol actually raise your blood cholesterol? We'll find out next. The question, does egg feeding, in other words dietary cholesterol, affect the level of cholesterol in the blood, was answered 40 years ago. Give someone half a cup of eggs a day, and within two, three, four weeks their cholesterol keeps going up, and then stop the eggs by switching to an egg substitute, and the cholesterol comes down. Or start people on the egg substitute, and not much happens, but then start feeding eggs, and their cholesterol shoots right up. Put people on a cholesterol-free diet, and their cholesterols drop, but then add some egg yolk cholesterol, and their cholesterol goes up. Take it away, and their cholesterol goes down. You could do this all year. And it's within days, 10 days of eggs, and cholesterol shot up 50 points. Take the eggs away, and it comes back down. You can reproduce this effect over and over and over and over, though evidently penguin omelets are only about half as deadly. Switch people from a high cholesterol diet to a cholesterol-free diet, and you can drop blood cholesterol levels as much as 100 points. OK, but that was giving people more than a half a cup of egg yolks a day. But even just a single egg a day can increase people's LDL cholesterol 12%. Put all the studies together in this 2020 meta-analysis, more than 50 randomized controlled trials feeding people eggs, and egg consumption significantly increases LDL cholesterol, period. Now, studies funded by the Egg Board use a variety of methods to try to minimize the reported negative health effects of eggs by, for example, claiming that dietary cholesterol affects only certain people. That's actually been put to the test, and only 3% were even potentially non-responders to dietary cholesterol, and even these probably evidence some adverse response. Wait, then how was the Egg Board able to design a study in which egg intake did not change blood cholesterol, by feeding them sufficiently large quantities of dairy and meat. Uh, see, there's a plateau effect. Though all lines of evidence converge to indicate that dietary cholesterol is a major factor in promoting hardening of the arteries, confusion about dietary cholesterol has arisen because above a certain ceiling you basically max out cholesterol absorption. 
Uh, check it out. If you're eating a strictly plant-based diet with a baseline of zero cholesterol intake, and you start adding meat, dairy, or eggs to your diet, you can get a dramatic rise in blood cholesterol. But as your diet starts out more and more meaty, you can saturate your system and basically max out on the additional effect. So no wonder the egg board packed in the extra meat and dairy to mask the egg effect. A systematic review of egg industry funding and cholesterol research sought out to see if industry-funded studies were more likely to report conclusions that were not supported by their own objective findings. Of the non-industry-funded studies on the effect of egg ingestion on cholesterol, cholesterol increases were reported in about 90%. Among industry-funded studies, cholesterol increases were reported in about 90%. In other words, even the egg industry-funded study showed eggs increased blood cholesterol, and not a single study funded by anyone showed a significant decrease. OK, but here's the crazy part. About half of the industry-funded studies reported conclusions that were discordant with their own results. In other words, they found that cholesterol went up, but if you read their conclusions, they exonerated eggs. That's why you can't just read the abstract. You actually have to see what they found. Readers, editors, and the public should remain alert to funding sources in interpreting study findings and conclusions. The vegan diet as a neglected cause of psychosis. A tragic story of a 47-year-old woman with a five-year history of psychosis treated with antipsychotics, years of hallucinations, Finally, her mother revealed that the patient was following a strict vegan diet for seven years and was not supplementing with vitamin B12. They started giving her B12 supplements, and eventually her psychiatric symptoms went away. But she spent five years of her life in a psychotic haze because she wasn't getting a regular, reliable source of vitamin B12. B12 supplements, or sufficient intake of B12-fortified foods, is mandatory for vegans, and effective, but only if you do it. Uh, like in the largest study of vegans in history, the Adventist II study, the prevalence of low vitamin B12 status was the same between vegans, vegetarians, and meat eaters. Why? Presumably because they were eating fortified foods and supplements. The researchers concluded the encouragement of vitamin B12 supplementation cannot be overemphasized. Vitamins B12 and D are the only two vitamins not made by plants. B12 is made by microbes, and vitamin D is made by animals such as ourselves when we walk outside. It's the sunshine vitamin. Some other nutrients are only found concentrated in certain plants, though, and you can become deficient if you don't eat them. For example, this case of a 10-year-old girl with night blindness. She couldn't see well at night. Vitamin A deficiency was the doctor's first thought, but the kid was vegetarian, and so getting whopping doses of beta-carotene and all the vegetables she ate, which your body turns into vitamin A. Almost as an afterthought, as they were leaving the office, the doctor just asked the mother, I assume she's getting plenty of vegetables, right? But no, she does not like vegetables and only eats like, I don't know, rich crackers or something. So with something like vitamin A, it's easy getting enough eating greens or any of the orange fruits and vegetables like mangoes, sweet potatoes, carrots, or cantaloupe. But you actually have to eat fruits and vegetables. A vegan living off a diet of fast food is at a greater risk for vitamin A deficiency than a meat eater living on fast food, because at least the cow ate some greens and passed it along. Iodine is a similar situation. Cow's milk is a primary source of dietary iodine in the United States, not because cows somehow synthesize iodine or any other element. Iodine in milk comes from the leaching of iodine-containing disinfectants used to clean contaminated udders and milking equipment into the milk, or from supplements fed to cattle. Regardless, those not drinking milk or eating seaweed, which is an even better source, may be an increased risk for iodine deficiency. A study of vegans in the UK suggests that as many as 90% aren't getting enough in their diet, though this is likely an overestimate, since their food frequency questionnaire didn't include seaweed or iodized salt, two of the ways some may be getting it. Are there reports of it actually causing problems? Yes, indeed. Veganism as a cause of iodine-deficient hypothyroidism. 23-month-old boy breastfed until 16 months of age, then weaned on a strictly plant-based diet without iodized salt. Mom was fine, presumably because of the iodine and her prenatal vitamins that she continued to take, which spilled over into her breast milk. 
The American Thyroid Association is very clear about recommending that pregnant and breastfeeding women take a prenatal with 150 micrograms of iodine a day. Most kids in the U.S. transition from breast milk to cow's milk, but those who don't need to get their iodine from somewhere. Thankfully, after an iodine-containing multivitamin, his deficiency cleared. That's one way, taking supplements like the cows do. But sea vegetables are the healthiest source of iodine. A half teaspoon of mild seaweeds like arame or dulse should get you all the iodine you need for the day. You can just have a shaker of dulse flakes at the kitchen table, or two nori sheets of seaweed. That's my favorite method, because you can just eat them like a snack. In fact, probably the healthiest snack, since you're snacking on dark green leafy vegetables. There was also a recent report of severe iron deficiency anemia attributed to a plant-based diet in menorrhagia, which means excess blood loss during menstruation. A 21-year-old woman presented with reduced vision in one of her eyes because a vein clotted off, which can happen when you get really anemic. Thankfully, her vision resolved after taking iron supplements. Now, according to the American Dietetic Association, the incidence of iron deficiency anemia among vegetarians is no worse than that of non-vegetarians so it may have just been her excess monthly blood loss. But a more recent review questioned the official position that iron deficiency anemia appears no more prevalent among vegetarian women than among non-vegetarian women. The updated review claimed to find four studies where this wasn't the case, where vegetarians had significantly higher rates. Yet, here's the four studies. And as always, I'll put links to them in the Sources Cited section beneath this video on nutritionfacts.org, so you can read them yourself, like I do for every study I cite in my videos. And not a single one backed up that statement. But just because vegetarians don't have worse anemia rates than non-vegetarians, that's not saying much, since up to 1 in 20 menstruating women suffer from iron deficiency anemia across the board. Having lower iron stores is actually advantageous, as I've done videos about, yet another reason to consume more plants and less meat. But if your blood count is dropping, if your hemoglobin is getting too low, then you can enhance iron absorption by eating vitamin C-rich foods with your meals, so fresh fruit, bell peppers, broccoli, etc. And since especially tea, but also coffee, can inhibit iron absorption, you shouldn't drink them with meals. African Americans have a higher burden of cardiovascular disease and diabetes than other American ethnic groups, but recent evidence indicates that eating a plant-based diet may help eliminate such health disparities, as I explored previously. African Americans as a group tend to have the highest reported meat consumption and the lowest vegetable consumption, and part of this is access, but this article detailing the experience of a Morehouse lifestyle medical clinic noted that there also appears to be an issue with aspects of the African-American food culture. Enter the REGARDS study, the Reasons for Geographic and Racial Differences in Stroke study. The study found that regardless of where African-Americans live in the United States, they are much more likely to consume what the researchers called a southern diet, which is a dietary pattern characterized by added fats, fried foods, eggs, organ meats, processed meats, and sugar-sweetened beverages. They found that this type of dietary pattern mediates the majority of the racial disparity. Adherence to the southern dietary pattern increased stroke risk by 39% in black Americans. In contrast, the greatest benefit was seen among participants who followed a more plant-based dietary pattern, which conferred a 29% lower stroke risk. Same thing with heart failure. Eating more plant-based was associated with a 41% lower risk of heart failure, while the southern dietary pattern was associated with a 72% higher risk, and this is after controlling for things like education and income. Death from kidney disease. Same thing, more plant-based linked to lower risk of mortality, whereas eating closer to the southern diet associated with a greater risk of kidney disease mortality. Those eating more southern-style diets likewise had a 56% higher hazard of acute heart disease. This finding was particularly interesting. Dietary patterns and the risk of sepsis. Uh, sepsis is the syndrome of body-wide inflammation triggered by infection, and is a major public health problem. Uh, that's how an infection can kill you. Now, we know diet plays a vital role in immune health, but its association with sepsis was unclear. 
But a southern dietary pattern of eating was associated with a higher risk of sepsis as well, particularly among black participants. What about cognitive function? Once again, greater consumption of the southern dietary pattern was associated with worse outcomes, lower scores on the assessments of each of the cognitive domains like learning and memory, whereas greater consumption of the plant-based pattern was associated with higher scores. Here's the data on learning. The more plant-based people ate, the better they were at a learning task. Meanwhile, the more southern-style people ate, the worse they were at learning. Same thing with memory. Better, the more plant-based, worse, the more southern-style. It is therefore possible that the increased prevalence of Alzheimer's in African Americans could be partially reduced via dietary modification. Easy for privileged me to tell people to eat healthier, but isn't it expensive to eat plant-based? Uh, have you seen the price of beans? There's this common misconception that plant-based diets are more costly than animal-based ones, so proper education will be needed. A vegetarian diet could result in approximately $750 per year in savings, so healthier and cheaper. Uh, what would you do with an extra $750 in your pocket, uh, not to mention all the health care cost savings? I mean, a plant-based dinner consisting of red beans, brown rice, collard greens, sweet potato, and cornbread could feed a family of four for under $12, or three bucks per person. Check it out. Some of the healthiest foods on the planet are some of the cheapest foods. Such a meal would not only be cost-effective, but nutritious, providing a mountain of nutrition, plus a host of antioxidants to protect against various diseases like heart disease and cancer. Here's the save 750 bucks a year eating more plant-based study. Why? Because you're cutting out meat, poultry, seafood. And when one considers total grocery costs, animal products can be the most expensive components, costing more than double the cost of a serving of vegetables or legumes like beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils. Purveyors of erythritol like to talk about how this low-calorie sweetener is a natural constituent of foods like melons and peaches, but it's in such tiny amounts, the average person only gets like 25 milligrams, and now that it's manufactured commercially, intake could easily be a thousand times that. I've done a few videos about it. What's the update? Well, here's a paper with a twist. Erythritol, a non nutritive sugar alcohol sweetener and the main component of Truvia brand sweetener, is a palatable ingested insecticide. Huh? Yeah, they found it killed fruit flies. And so they suggested we start using erythritol as a safe, sustainable approach for pest control. It evidently induces in flies lethal regurgitation, also kills the yellow fever mosquito, termites, and ants. So why isn't erythritol sprayed on crops? because it hurts the crops too. At the doses needed to kill insects, it has damaging effects on the plants. But hey, if it hurts plants, maybe we can use it as an herbicide too. OK, but what about just as a human sweetener? We've long known that the bacteria that produce dental plaque on teeth aren't fueled by erythritol, and they can't seem to make acid out of it either to cause cavities. As long as plaque stays above a pH of 5.7, food is safe for teeth and swish with some erythritol, and nothing happens, whereas then swish with some table sugar, and pH dips down to the danger zone. But xylitol, a sugar alcohol similar to erythritol, isn't just dentally safe in terms of not causing cavities, but may actually have an active cavity-stopping benefit. See, dental cavities are reversible if detected and treated sufficiently early. Early on, we thought that cavity reduction found in xylitol studies, where people chewed on xylitol gum or sucked on xylitol candies, may have just been due to indirect effects, like uh, getting your saliva going. Or hey, every xylitol candy may be one less sugar candy, so maybe it's just a substitution effect. Can you imagine how you might design a study to test if there were direct xylitol effects? I'll give you a moment to pause, try to come up with something. How about secretly randomizing people to use xylitol-containing toothpaste? And indeed, 
boom, a reduction in tooth decay compared to the control toothpaste without the xylitol. So xylitol really does seem to have cavity-reducing effects. What about erythritol, then? All studies strongly support the idea of erythritol as being cavity-reducing, too, perhaps even more so than xylitol. For example, more than twice the drop in the amount of plaque after six months sucking on erythritol candies versus xylitol. In effect, that extends out at least three years. Yeah, but did that actually translate into fewer cavities? Uh, we have all these studies pointing in that direction. However, no long-term human cavity trials on erythritol have been completed. Until now, a double-blind randomized controlled trial involving hundreds of schoolchildren sucking on four erythritol, xylitol, or control candies three times per school day, and erythritol won the day. Significantly lower number of cavity-ridden teeth and surfaces were found in the erythritol group. Another advantage to erythritol is safety to dogs. Uh, doses of xylitol, as little as a half teaspoon in a 30-pound dog, can be life-threatening, whereas erythritol is so well tolerated, with no adverse effects reported upwards of like more than a cup a day, suggesting it could even be used as like an ingredient in chew toys or something. Our lifetime risk of developing an invasive cancer, not like some superficial skin cancer like ductal carcinoma of the breast, but serious cancer, is about 40%. Two in five of us are going to get a cancer diagnosis in our lifetimes. What can we do to reduce our risk? Only about 5% of cancers are caused by problem genes we inherited from our parents. The other 95% are caused by mutations in our DNA we acquire in our lifetimes. Uh, for example, based on a genetic analysis of lung cancer, smokers may acquire an average of one DNA mutation for every 15 cigarettes smoked. Uh, smoking is bad, but the number one cause of these mutations is our diet. And that's not even including the cancers attributed to obesity. I've got tons of videos on dietary approaches to prevent cancer, but what if you already have it? Well-meaning professionals sometimes counsel cancer patients to eat whatever you want. Given the time constraints that doctors face, it may be understandable that the treating oncologist, the, the treating cancer doctor, may be reluctant to engage in a conversation about nutrition, but given the critical role the diet may play, uh, perhaps it should be a critical part of their job to be able to answer patients' questions about nutrition before and after cancer treatment and not default to the unhelpful, it doesn't really matter, eat whatever you want, which may not be in the best interest of the patient. The official recommendation of the American Institute of Cancer Research, a leading authority on diet and cancer, is that those with cancer should follow the same diet that helps prevent cancer from taking root in the first place. That means more whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans, while limiting fast food, processed food, meat, soda, and alcohol. Similar recommendations have been put forth by other cancer authorities. More fruit, vegetables, whole grains, and beans and less salt, sugar, meat, and alcohol. Cancer survivors uh, adhering to these guidelines do seem to live significantly longer, at least older female cancer survivors, the only group in which it's been looked at so far. Uh, they add that there are certain foods that may be beneficial in cancer care, including uh, beans, berries, cruciferous vegetables, flaxseed, garlic, green tea, tomatoes, and others, but you know, emphasize it's not about a single magic bullet food or component, but the combination of foods in a predominantly plant-based diet. Here's how some popular diets used by cancer patients stack up. Uh, the so-called alkaline diet gets high marks for being uh, vegetable-focused and encouraging people to cut down on animal foods. Uh, the keto diet does the worst, uh, though they get points for keeping people away from refined grains, alcohol, and soft drinks. Uh, macrobiotic diets you really kind of win the day, being closest to a whole food plant-based diet centered around whole grains, vegetables, and beans though may not be advising enough fruit. Paleo diets are a mixed bag with insufficient whole grains and beans and too much meat, and the vegan diet starts out strong but doesn't necessarily preclude all manner of vegan junk food. Have any of these diets been 
put to the test? Uh, I've done a video on the abject failure of the keto diet. The alkaline diet was tried on 11 lung cancer patients. Uh, they lived an average of 20 and a half months, which is about 40% longer than most patients have historically lived, but there was no direct control group. The only diet proven in a randomized control trial to reverse the progression of cancer was Dr. Dean Ornish's whole food plant-based lifestyle program, which I've covered before. Most randomized controlled trials to date on diet and cancer are like this, right? Feasibility studies, just to see if like, you can even get cancer patients to eat healthier, period. Uh, otherwise, I mean, what's the point of even running the study? Here they did find they could get patients with head and neck cancer to ramp up green leafy and cruciferous vegetable intake up to nine cups a week, so it's at least something you could test. We don't yet have outcomes data, but why wait? Right? What's the downside of trying to eat healthier? It may even save your life another way. Cardiovascular disease competes with breast cancer as the leading cause of death for older women diagnosed with breast cancer. Researchers follow more than 60,000 women diagnosed with breast cancer over the age of 65 for an average of nine years, by which time half had died. And the number one cause of death was actually cardiovascular disease edging out the breast cancer. And so choosing a healthy diet centered around whole plant foods, the only diet ever proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, may save your life whether you have cancer or not. In my last video series on halitosis, I explored the benefits of eating a high-fiber diet for causing a reduction of halitosis. This effect is thought to be due to the self-cleaning of the mouth while chewing food. However, soft foods, like how most fast food is designed so you can gulp it down, do not sufficiently scrape at the coating on your tongue, and so you can be left with a tongue coating, a whitish-gray layer of debris and microorganisms, particularly towards the back of your tongue. During the putrefaction of debris on the tongue, volatile sulfur compounds are created, like the rotten egg gas hydrogen sulfide. This putrefaction process may be responsible for up to 90% of bad breath. I did a video on dietary tweaks to lessen the formation of these compounds in the first place, but if you're unwilling or unable to change your diet, natural self-cleaning mechanisms might not necessarily remove the tongue coating if it's really thick, in which case mechanical tongue cleaning can remove debris. But often tongue cleaning is not considered a routine part of oral hygiene. Should it be? Let's find out. Unless you have some pocket of pus from like periodontal disease, the most likely source of bad breath is the surface of your tongue. And it's not like there's one bad actor bacteria. Dozens of different bacteria can produce the same volatile sulfur compounds from the sulfur-containing amino acids concentrated in animal protein. That's why probiotics may fail to change the emissions. In fact, if you compare the tongue microbiome in healthy subjects versus those with bad breath, they have almost the same bacterial composition. So it may be less which type of bacteria you have on your tongue and more the sheer quantity of how many bacteria you have living there. Population studies suggest that the use of tongue scrapers is associated with less severe symptoms of halitosis, but maybe those who use tongue scrapers are also more scrupulous about oral hygiene in other ways. The only way to know for sure is to put it to the test. Uh, first, though, some background. Tongue scraping and brushing have been practiced for centuries in many continents around the world, but it's been almost unknown elsewhere. Why clean your tongue? asked this editorial in the Journal of the American Dental Association. Dentists, hygienists, and manufacturers of toothpaste, toothbrushes, and floss have long emphasized the need to remove dental plaque from your teeth to prevent cavities. But why do so many Americans produce two immaculate shining rows of teeth separated by an organ covered with millions of microorganisms emitting a strong malodor? First of all, though, what might be the effect of tongue brushing on formation of dental plaque? Like, if you stop brushing your teeth completely, would it matter if you brush your tongue? No. Stop brushing your teeth, and the plaque builds up either way. Uh, yeah, but what if you continue brushing, but just add tongue brushing along with tooth brushing? No effect on the buildup of plaque on your teeth, suggesting that the majority of the important plaque-forming bacteria might not originate from the tongue. 
though another reason for not finding an effective tongue brushing on plaque formation may be that brushing of the back of the tongue is difficult because it can make you gag. What about gingivitis, gum inflammation? Those who clean their tongues tended to have less bleeding on probing, suggesting healthier gums, but you don't really know if it's cause and effect until you put it to the test. A randomized controlled clinical trial tongue scraping versus no tongue scraping, and it made no significant difference. What about tongue scraping as a means to reduce the acid-producing bacteria that cause cavities, called strep mutans? This study showed a beneficial effect compared to using Listerine brand oral care strips or saltwater rinses, but this other study found no significant effect. Maybe the population of bacteria is just so large that scraping removed only a small portion, or maybe it's like sweeping a rug where you're just kind of moving stuff around. The bottom line is that studies investigating the role of tongue brushing and plaque accumulation or gum inflammation show conflicting results. And so on the basis of the medical research, there appears to be no data that justify the necessity to clean the tongue on a regular basis. Ah, but the one exception would be oral malodor. It works for combating bad breath, which we'll explore next. Increased public awareness and demand for bad breath remedies has resulted in a substantial growth of the breath freshening industry and the saturation of the market with breath-improving products such as mints, chewing gum, breath sprays, and pills, the majority of which have only a short-term masking effect on bad breath and are essentially ineffective. Well, what can we do? Could it be as simple as swishing with some water? Take morning breath. Malodorous breath upon wakening after a night's sleep is a common condition known as morning bad breath. The most common cause of bad breath in general is the degradation of protein and protein fragments by microorganisms residing on the tongue and teeth, particularly the sulfur-containing amino acids cysteine and methionine that are broken down into volatile sulfur compounds like the rotten egg gas hydrogen sulfide. Approximately 50% of the adult population has early morning concentrations of these compounds in mouth air that exceed the threshold of objectionability, uh, established by the organoleptic panel. What does that mean? The organoleptic method is considered the gold standard in the examination of breath malodor. Basically, all this means is some examiner sniffs the air exhaled from the mouth and nose and subjectively defines the presence or absence of odor. And when people's morning breath are sniffed, about half exceed the threshold of objectionability. Why? What causes it? A dry mouth. Low salivary flow, particularly during the night, creates like a stagnant pond effect, favorable for bacterial proliferation and putrefaction. And so to reduce morning bad breath, you may read suggestions that rinsing with or drinking water upon wakening is effective, but you don't know until you put it to the test. The effect of water on morning bad breath, a randomized clinical trial. One group was randomized to rinse their mouths with a tablespoon of water, and the other to drink about a cup. And they both worked, significantly improving bad breath, with no apparent differences between them. Though they didn't have a control group, and it would have been interesting to see how much their breath improved just being awake with their normal salivary flow. After drinking and eating in the morning, morning breath tends to disappear. People brush their teeth in the morning, thinking that's going to help, but that may only reduce rotten egg gas levels 30%, whereas eating breakfast works twice as well, a 60% drop in hydrogen sulfide levels. The mechanical action of chewing stimulates the flow of saliva, and the passage of food over the surface of the tongue removes the putrefied surface film, thus simulating the action of tongue brushing. Well, if it's a matter of the amount of tongue coating there is, how about actively brushing your tongue like you would your teeth? And you get closer to a 70% drop, suggesting the tongue is the major source of the stinky gases. Other studies, though, show no benefit to tongue brushing on oral odor in both adults and children. The researchers suggest maybe the gag reflex kept people from doing a better job. What about tongue scraping? In this study, they compared tooth brushing, brushing plus flossing, brushing plus scraping, or all three. They found that adding flossing didn't really seem to affect morning breath, and that tongue scraping won the day against tooth brushing, suggesting that tongue cleaning may be the most important hygienic procedure to reduce morning bad breath. 
This is not to suggest toothbrushing doesn't help with bad breath. Here, they had people stop brushing their teeth for five days, but continue to floss and tongue scrape, all while doing their fancy organoleptic technique where they blew through a straw into some poor examiner's nose. And despite all that scraping and flossing, their breath got worse when they stopped brushing. What about tongue brushing versus tongue scraping? Researchers compiled all the randomized control trials comparing different methods of tongue cleaning to reduce mouth odor in adults with halitosis, and the tongue scraping was found to be slightly more effective than tongue brushing. Perhaps the fact that the width of a toothbrush is smaller than the width of a regular tongue scraper might make it less effective in removing loosened debris from the tongue. Tongue cleaning can reduce the stinky gaseous compounds that cause bad breath by up to 75%, whereas just brushing your teeth alone may only reduce by 25%. This is why tongue cleaning has the greatest priority in the treatment of bad breath. Are there any downsides? Well, most people do not enjoy placing an object towards the back of their throats, as it can trigger the gag reflex. Tips to help prevent this include momentarily stopping breathing during tongue cleaning, you can experiment, and if the mint flavor in toothpaste sensitizes your throat to an elevated gag reflex, you may want to clean the tongue before toothbrushing. Some recommendations even suggest doing it on an empty stomach in case vomiting ensues. That doesn't sound very pleasant. But when tongue cleaning is practiced on a daily basis, the process evidently becomes easier and less objectionable over time. So the main complaint of the subjects is the gagging reflex, and you know, also, you know, tongue carcinogenesis related to mechanical stimulation. Wait, <laughs> tongue carcinogenesis means the development of tongue cancer. These are unpleasant side effects associated with tongue cleaning devices. Uh, cancer is more than an unpleasant side effect. I mean, I know there's alcohol-containing mouthwashes, and one might expect that to predispose people to oral cancer. I talked about this in my alcohol and breast cancer video, a single sip of an alcoholic beverage, one teaspoon swished and even spit out after just five seconds, results in carcinogenic concentrations of the toxic alcohol breakdown product acetaldehyde being produced from ethanol in the oral cavity instantly after a small sip of a strong alcoholic beverage, and this exposure continues for at least 10 minutes after just those five seconds. And yes, this concern extends to alcohol-containing mouthwash. Researchers determined that alcohol-containing mouthwashes offers a rather low margin of safety, and that prudent public health policy should recommend generally refraining from using them. OK, yeah, we know alcohol causes cancer, but why tongue scraping? Well, animal experiments have shown that mechanical injuries of the tongue may be carcinogenic. OK, even if you could extrapolate to people, are you actually injuring the tongue when you scrape it? Uh, what exactly did these experiments entail? Concerns have been raised based on an experiment in rodents involving the experimental induction of tongue cancer using carcinogenic dimethylbenzanthracine, a powerful carcinogen found in cigarette smoke and broiled meats. And they evidently produced more cancer with the carcinogen if they injured the tongue using a root canal instrument. Here's the study they cite. Indeed, scratching their tongues with essentially a little piece of barbed wire did result in more cancer, presumably because the ulceration or injury allowed the, for greater retention and penetration of the carcinogen into deeper tissue layers. But people don't scrape their tongues with barbed wire. Ah, but evidently even a regular toothbrush can do it? This appears to be the study they cite for that, but it doesn't say regular toothbrush, but rather extreme mechanical stimulation though then in the figure they say it was just one stroke with a dental brooch with a very light force that did not cause bleeding, which was apparently enough to cause the cancer to show up about a month earlier. So what was it? A toothbrush, extreme stimulation, or just a light scratch? Here's the original data, and thanks to our wonderful Japanese volunteers, I'm told it was no toothbrush. And even if it was and could be extrapolated, that was with a carcinogen. So unless you were smoking or using chewing tobacco or eating barbecued chicken every day, there doesn't seem to be any parallel. If you just scratch a hamster's tongue with a barbed wire every day, no tumors develop. And another thing, 
Most human tongue cancers are found on the side of the tongue, and so the relationship between tongue scraping and cancer has not yet been confirmed in humans, though there's still a possibility that mechanical stimulation may be a cause, so I'd recommend taking it easy. In this study, uh, they had been brushing their tongue with an electric toothbrush with medium-hard bristles, and ended up causing an increase in the expression of CFOS in tongue muscle cells, which is a protein that may be involved in cancer development. Any kind of electrical device for tongue cleaning is not recommended, but even a manual toothbrush can cause some damage, so-called microbleeding. Uh, therefore, tongue cleaning should be carried out gently, with low force to avoid unnecessary tissue trauma, and just the top surface of the tongue should be cleaned, not the sides. The human mouth is an important habitat for microbes, harboring up to 10 billion bacteria. And no wonder, it's all warm and moist, providing a suitable environment for bacterial growth, some of which are actually beneficial. For example, it's widely recognized that dietary nitrate affords cardiovascular protection by turning into nitric oxide. And guess what contributes to the generation of nitric oxide? Our oral microbiome. First, we eat nitrate-rich vegetables like dark green leafies and beets. The nitrate is then absorbed into our bloodstream, and our body then pulls it out of circulation to be concentrated in our salivary glands and secreted back into the oral cavity. Why? Because our body knows there are good bacteria on our tongue to tweak it, eventually resulting in the synthesis of the artery-protecting nitric oxide. We've got more than a billion people with high blood pressure, most of which is uncontrolled. As such, it's critical to optimize daily behaviors to support blood pressure regulation, and incorporating nitrate-rich foods may be an optimal strategy, as it supports opening of arteries via the enterosalivary pathway, the gut-saliva pathway, thanks to the friendly flora in our mouth. Dietary nitrate can provide sustained blood pressure lowering, and that starts with eating our greens. Leafy green vegetables contribute 80% of nitrate intake, but it doesn't matter how many greens we eat if we have oral dysbiosis, if we don't have the right tongue bugs to take advantage of them. How can you screw up your oral-friendly flora? By using an antiseptic mouthwash. Yeah, it can kill the bad bugs that cause plaque, but it can indiscriminately kill the good bugs too, and that can have systemic consequences. For example, studies show an increase in blood pressure following the use of antibacterial mouth rinses, because they reduce the protective bacteria in your mouth necessary for the nitric oxide pathway, a pathway that's vital to blood pressure regulation and overall cardiovascular health. Just a single week of antibacterial mouthwash use can cause a significant increase in blood pressure. And it's not just one study. All human studies done to date have revealed deleterious effects of antibacterial mouthwash. OK, so what about tongue cleaning, brushing your tongue or using a tongue scraper? Regular tongue cleaning is recommended by the American Dental Association as a way to cut down on the bacteria on your tongue that cause bad breath, but if it wipes out those bacteria, it might wipe out the good ones too. It turns out tongue cleaning may give you the best of both worlds. Those who clean their tongue twice or more per day as part of their normal oral hygiene were more likely to have an increase in systolic blood pressure during use of the antibacterial mouthwash, suggesting they had more of the good bugs to kill. Here's the graph. The mouthwash was worse for those with better tongue hygiene, so regular tongue cleaning may result in a baseline tongue microbiome that has a greater ability to tweak nitrate, and conversely, failure to clean the tongue daily may result in a microbiome composition that is unfavorable to nitrate conversion. Now, but wait a second. Maybe tongue cleaning just disrupts the surface bacteria, making them easier for the mouthwash to pick off. To see if tongue cleaning was actually associated with a better oral microbiome, they did DNA analyses to elucidate the dynamics of the tongue microbiome to compare differences between time points and tongue hygiene cohorts, and it turns out tongue cleaning does appear to have a significant impact on the composition of the tongue microbiome, specifically increasing the proportion of the good bacteria. So, Based on this study, tongue cleaning assumes a new importance from the perspective of blood pressure regulation, as daily tongue cleaning appears to favor the increased abundance and in metabolic activity of the nitrate metabolizing species like Neisseria, whereas failure to clean the tongue daily may result in a microbiome composition that is less favorable to nitric oxide production.
Now, you still have to eat your vegetables. Right? Regular tongue cleaning together with adequate dietary intake of nitrate, since that has a twofold benefit. First, dietary nitrate improves artery function. Right? Eat some nitrate-rich vegetables, and within three hours, an improvement of artery function. And the nitrate can also act as a prebiotic for the oral microbiome. The most abundant, best nitrate converter is Neisseria flavicens, and you can boost its abundance after feeding it with vegetables. After six weeks of a beet juice that's had its nitrate removed, not much change, but after six weeks of regular beet juice, and Neisseria jumps right up, making your mouth a nitric oxide-making machine. And if you look at the association between nitrate-reducing oral bacteria and cardiometabolic outcomes, having more of this good bacteria in your mouth is linked to all sorts of cardiometabolic benefits, letting you take full advantage of the veggies you eat. What if all you ate was plants? The impact of a vegan diet on the human salivary microbiome and a fully plant-based diet was associated significantly with more of the good Neisseria bugs that help you churn out nitric oxide. So not only does eating plant-based boost the beneficial bacteria at the end of your digestive tract, but at the beginning too. And eating nitrate-rich vegetables like greens doesn't just boost the good bacteria, but beats down the bad guys, the bacteria that cause cavities, bad breath, and gum disease. And indeed, if you feed people lettuce or lettuce juice, so you can do a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial with a lettuce juice control that's had the nitrate removed, you can significantly improve the health of your gums with greens. The researchers conclude that dietary nitrate consumption may be a useful adjunct to the control of chronic gingivitis. So when reviews suggest there's no reason to clean your tongue unless you have bad breath, and in the absence of a coating on your tongue there's no reason to clean it, that was all before this new data, which suggests additional benefits. The only caveat would be those with heart valve problems, or a pacemaker, or anything else that puts you at risk for endocarditis, an infection within the heart. Uh, you may want to stay away from tongue scraping, given this case report tentatively tying the two together. Just like you can get a heart infection after tongue piercing, tongue scraping may introduce a few bacteria into your bloodstream that could be hazardous for someone at risk. Previously, I've explored how tongue cleaning may be the best way to cut down on bad breath, and have the remarkable side benefit of potentially helping with blood pressure regulation, as daily tongue cleaning appears to favor the increased abundance and metabolic activity of the good bacteria on your tongue that help you make your body's natural artery dilator nitric oxide. But there's another way tongue cleaning may improve your blood pressure. After two weeks of tongue cleaning, you can improve your sensitivity to tasting salt, and a follow-up study found that just a single cleaning can do it. They applied a drop of tomato soup to people's tongues before and after they cleaned their tongues with a plastic tongue scraper with the adorable name Scrapey, and they experienced a significant increase in salt taste intensity. Why is that good? Because if a simple tongue cleaning could change the perceived intensity of salt, it could be used to rapidly make lower salt concentrations more acceptable to people without changing the palatability of the food. They therefore recommend that people scrape their tongue every day in order to adapt to foods with lower salt concentrations to effectively decrease their taste for death. After all, excess sodium intake is the deadliest thing about the human diet responsible for millions of deaths every year. So that benefit alone could justify tongue cleaning. OK, so what's the best way to do it? A systematic review and meta-analysis conclude that tongue cleaning offers benefits. However, there is insufficient evidence to recommend a specific frequency, duration, or method of tongue cleaning. But let's see what data are out there. Tongue scraping was found to be slightly more effective than tongue brushing in treating bad breath perhaps due to the fact that the width of a toothbrush is smaller than the width of a tongue scraper. But there are now toothbrushes on the market with a tongue scraper on the back of their head. Here's what they look like, and they seem to have a similar performance in terms of breath improvement. Some people feel that tongue brushing is more gag-inducing than tongue scraping, so appear to prefer scrapers. On the other hand, if you just brush your tongue, you don't have to buy an extra gizmo. Technique-wise, you want to make sure you include the back of your tongue, and importantly, the cleaning should be gentle to prevent damaging your tongue. Cleaning too hard with a tongue scraper can risk tongue injury, and you should just clean the top surface of your tongue, not the sides of your tongue. 
How often should you do it? Well, tooth brushing should be twice a day, but the tongue cleaning recommendations seem to be more uncertain. So researchers decided to study the rate of reformation of tongue coatings after scraping. They took folks who had at least 20% of their tongue covered with a coating thick enough to conceal the pink color of their tongue. They started out with about a third of their tongue covered, and scraping reduced it to under 10%. The question is how long would it take to regrow? On average, tongue coating scores had returned to baseline levels on day two. So if tongue cleaning is to be recommended, it should probably be performed on a daily basis. What kind of scraper is best? Researchers had people try nine different tongue scrapers. Here are the brand names, rated using six different criteria, and these two were most preferred out of the available options. What's the best way to disinfect tongue scrapers and toothbrushes? In my video on the best water purifier, I ended up speaking about disinfecting your toothbrush by soaking it in a 50-50 white vinegar water solution for 10 minutes. But this is even easier, just microwaving your toothbrush or tongue scraper for one minute. Then you don't have to keep buying new toothbrushes. And it's interesting, we don't even know exactly why it works. Like, you'd think it's just heat sterilization, but I mean, there must be other factors, since I nuked my toothbrush for a minute and hardly even got warm. But it kills off the bacteria nonetheless. What about all the fancy new tongue cleaners on the market? Throughout the last century, there have been many U.S. patents on various ingenious tongue cleaning devices. I mean, how much money can you make selling plain little cheap plastic ones? So, how about an ultrasound tongue cleaner, or tongue cleaning using a high-speed vacuum ejector, or a suction tongue cleaning device like a, like a tongue Roomba? But alas, a consensus group of dental professionals say there's no evidence that substantiates the benefits of using any kind of electrical device to clean your tongue. In fact, the lowest tech option is in everyone's home right now without buying a thing. You can just use a simple spoon. In my bestseller, How Not to Diet, my chapter on fat-blocking foods starts out with a command to eat your thylakoid's doctor's orders. What the heck is a thylakoid? Just the source of nearly all known life and the oxygen we breathe. Thylakoids are where photosynthesis takes place, the process by which plants turn light into food. Thylakoids are the great green engine of life, microscopic sac-like structures composed of chlorophyll-rich membranes concentrated in the leaves of plants. When we eat thylakoids, when we bite into a leaf of spinach, for example, those green leaf membranes don't immediately get digested. They can last for hours in our intestines, and that's when they work their magic. Thylakoid membranes bind to lipase. Lipase is the enzyme our body uses to digest fat, so if you bind the enzyme, you can slow fat absorption. It's like a natural version of the fat-blocking drug Orlistat, but without the anal leakage. This is because the effects of the thylakoids are temporary. Unlike the drug, the thylakoids do finally break down, eventually freeing the lipase enzyme to do its job before fat comes spilling out your other end. Ultimately, fat absorption is not so much blocked by thylakoids as it is delayed. If all the fat is eventually absorbed, what's the benefit? Location, location, location. There's a phenomenon known as the ileal break. The ileum is the last part of the small intestine before it empties into your colon. When undigested calories are detected that far down in our intestines, our body thinks we must be full from stem to stern, and puts the brakes on eating more by dialing down our appetite. This can be shown experimentally. If you insert a 9-foot tube down people's throats and drip in any calories, fat, protein, or sugar, you can activate the ileal break. Then sit them down to an all-you-can-eat meal, and compared to the placebo group, who had just gotten a squirt of water down the tube, they eat over 100 calories less. You just don't feel as hungry. You feel just as full, eating significantly less. That's the ileal break in action. So with thylakoids delaying calorie absorption until that tail end of your small intestine, small satiety signals are sent to the brain, which dials down your appetite. If you feed someone a meal with added thylakoids by slipping in some powdered spinach, and measure the level of hormone release in their bloodstream over the next six hours, you can see a significant rise in a satiety hormone called CCK, and a drop in the hunger hormone ghrelin. Does this then translate into a drop in appetite? Researchers were eager to find out. 
Spinach extracts were disguised in jam or juice to sneak thylakoids into meals, and those unwittingly eating the equivalent of about a half a cup of cooked spinach felt significantly less hungry and more satiated over the next few hours. Give someone the equivalent of a shot of wheatgrass juice in the morning, or what they might get in a green drink or green smoothie, and not only do they feel less hungry, more satiated, their cravings for presented salty, sweet, and fatty snacks— for example, potato chips, gummy bears, chocolate, and cinnamon buns— drop by about a third. Feed them candy anyway, and those who unknowingly have been snuck some spinach report liking the sweets significantly less. The satiating power of greens has been attributed to their high water and fiber content and low calorie density, but the thylakoids may be their secret weapon. Most thylakoid trials have shown improved satiety, but the real test is weight loss. Researchers in Sweden randomized overweight women to blended blueberry drinks every morning with or without green plant membranes. In other words, just covertly slip them some powdered spinach, and they get a boost in appetite-suppressing hormones, a decreased urge for sweets. Yes, indeed, spinach can cut your urge for chocolate. Check this out. Seven hours after eating spinach, you're like, chocolate? Eh, got any more spinach? And boom, accelerated weight loss, all thanks to eating green. The actual green itself, the chlorophyll-packed membranes and the leaves. Within 12 weeks, the women who were slipped spinach lost 11 pounds, significantly more than the control group, and as a bonus, their LDL cholesterol dropped too, even before the weight loss started kicking in. If you instead fix their calorie intake to force the same weight loss, those randomized to the spinach group may have had an easier time with eating less, experiencing less hunger after a test meal after weeks eating green. Extracts of spinach were used in these studies so they could create convincing placebos, but you can get just as many thylakoids eating about a half cup of cooked greens, which is what I recommend people eat at least two times a day in my daily dozen checklist of all the healthiest of healthy things I encourage people to try to fit into their daily routine. Which greens have the most? You can tell just by looking at them, because thylakoids are where the chlorophyll is. The greener the leaves, the more potent the effect. So go for the darkest green greens you can find, which in my area is the lacinata or dinosaur kale. What happens when you cook greens? Blanched for 15 seconds or so in steaming or boiling water, they actually get brighter green. But then if you cook them too long, right, they eventually turn kind of a drab olive brown. When you overcook greens, the thylakoids physically degrade, along with their ability to inhibit lipase. But within that first minute or so, when the green gets even more vibrant, there's a slight boost in fat blocking ability. So you can gauge thylakoid activity in both the grocery store and the kitchen with your own two eyes. The best green vegetable, though, and the best way to cook it is whichever and however you'll end up eating the most. We've been chewing on leaves for millions of years, but today the greenest thing about some people's diets may be a St. Paddy's Day pint. Americans have averaged less than 2 grams of spinach a day, less than half a teaspoon. Your body was designed to have thylakoids passing through your system on a daily basis, so the delay in fat absorption can be thought of as the default normal state. It's only when we eat greens-deficient diets that the accelerated fat digestion undercuts our natural satiety mechanisms. In the Journal of the Society of Chemical Industry, a group of food technologists argued that given their fat-blocking benefits, thylakoid membranes could be incorporated into functional foods as a new promising appetite-reducing ingredient. Or you can just get them the way Mother Nature intended. Two centuries have passed since James Parkinson's essay on the shaking palsy described a disease characterized by tremor and problems with movement. Today, treatment options include surgically implanting electrodes into the brain. There has to be a better way. We've known since the 1950s that Parkinson's disease is manifested by a dopamine deficiency in the brain. Well, then why not eat a dopamine diet? A variety of fruits and vegetables contain the same dopamine made by our brain. Unfortunately, dopamine can't cross the blood-brain barrier, and hence is ineffective as therapy. However, the dopamine precursor, known as L-dopa or levodopa, can get from the blood up into the brain, where it can then be converted to dopamine within the brain 
by an enzyme called decarboxylase. We don't want the levodopa to be converted to dopamine outside the brain, because then it can't get in, so we give people a decarboxylase inhibitor, which itself can't get into the brain, so that keeps levodopa from prematurely turning into dopamine before it gets into the brain where we need it. So eating dopamine-rich foods doesn't help, but what if we ate levodopa-rich foods? More than 1,500 years before Dr. Parkinson came on the scene, an Indian physician seemed to have nailed it and even suggested a treatment. Velvet beans, the plant with the highest amount of L-dopa. Huh. So might there be a way to forestall the epidemic of Parkinson's disease through plant-based remedies after all? Levodopa is the gold standard therapy for Parkinson's patients, but most Parkinson's patients in low-income areas cannot afford long-term daily levodopa therapy. In rural Africa, for example, it's estimated that only 15% of patients are treated with levodopa because the daily cost of levodopa treatment is about a dollar a day, which may be half of what people make in a day. Same with other regions in the global south. L-dopa is mostly unavailable or unaffordable. So patients frequently use powdered velvet beans as a replacement or supplement to the drug. But does it work? You never know until you put it to the test. Velvet beans in Parkinson's disease are randomized, double-blind clinical study, and a dose of 30 grams, which is about three tablespoons, led to a reliable and sustained anti-Parkinsonian effect in all patients, working significantly quicker than the drug, working significantly longer than the drug, and working significantly better than the drug in another double-blind, randomized, head-to-head -head crossover study. The levodopa in velvet beans appears to be two to three times more potent as compared to the same dose of pill form levodopa, suspected to be because there may be some intrinsic decarboxylase inhibitor compound in the plant as well. OK, but those were single-dose studies. What about the chronic use of velvet beans for Parkinson's? Fourteen patients with advanced Parkinson's received roasted velvet bean powder, or the standard drug, switching back and forth for months, looking at changes in quality of life, activities of daily living, movement, and non-movement symptoms, and time with good mobility without troublesome involuntary writhing movements. And the velvet beans seem to work as well as the drug in all measures of efficacy, including quality of life. Here's a video of someone with Parkinson's solely treated with velvet bean powder for 14 years before and after treatment. Okay. So can you put both hands out for me? And tap your fingers on the right, just the right. Try to go big. And the left. <laughs> and turn. The left, the right. Despite the efficacy, the chances of this cheap herbal remedy ever being licensed seems unlikely, and for good reason. First of all, uh, the stuff evidently tastes nasty, and we don't really have good data going out more than a few months. While velvet beans may potentially be part of the answer to Parkinson's disease management in low-income countries and high-income countries, one may be tempted to prefer them to drugs just because it's a more natural therapy, but researchers discourage patients and physicians to consider its use when the drugs are available. So leave it open pill form should remain the first-line treatment for Parkinson's. However, velvet bean powder may be better tolerated in certain patients. Psychologically, some patients just have a thing against taking pills, and so if they refuse, then certainly the beans can step in. But otherwise, velvet bean supplements suffer from the same issues common to all supplements, specifically lack of sufficient regulation and quality control. 
There's all sorts of brands out there, but there's no head-to-head -head comparisons as to which is best, and the quality of the products likely vary, but you don't know until you put it to the test. Six brands of Velvet Bean product were ordered through the internet, and most of them, four out of six, showed a large discrepancy between the claim on their label and the actual L-DOPA content, and only two even came close. The remaining products contain considerably less, less than 10% in two cases. Too bad there isn't a food source of L-DOPA that you could just eat instead of taking in a supplement. Well, wait a second. L-DOPA was originally discovered more than a century ago in fava beans. Might eating fava beans help with Parkinson's? I'll explore just that question next. Increased risk of Parkinson's disease has been associated with exposure to pesticides, consumption of dairy products, a history of melanoma, and traumatic brain injury. Uh, why is the risk of Parkinson's disease increased among individuals with high milk and dairy consumption? Uh, it could be the animal fat, maybe the animal protein. So why not use a plant food diet for the risk management of Parkinson's disease? There are phytochemicals that may target the underlying cause, but in terms of treatment, ancient sacred texts from thousands of years ago refer to trembling individuals who were prescribed a plant from the bean family to treat the condition. In my last video I talked about the use of velvet beans, but in 1913 the miracle drug L-DOPA was discovered for the first time in fava beans, also known as fava beans or broad beans, as a natural source of L-DOPA to consider. The amount varies considerably based on a number of factors, but typically it looks like they have about 10 times less than velvet beans, but that's okay since you can eat larger quantities, since fava beans are an actual food instead of a powdered supplement. The important thing is that the amount of L-DOPA in fava beans is enough to be pharmacologically active in Parkinson's disease. In fact, there are some reports indicating that Parkinson's patients might respond better to the beans than to standard L-DOPA preparations in pill form. But anecdotal reports that patients may gain benefit from a broad bean-rich diet don't cut it. What you have to do is put it to the test. Parkinson's patients were fed about one to third cups of cooked fava beans, and during the next four hours a substantial clinical improvement was noted. In fact, similar to the improvement seen after receiving the standard pharmacological combination of L-DOPA plus carbidopa, the decarboxylase inhibitor drug I talked about in the last video that boosts L-DOPA levels in the brain. No surprise that there was a similar effect, since they had very similar L-DOPA levels in the blood. In fact, half the time you could hardly tell the beans from the drugs. How could there be the same levels if the bean L-DOPA lacked the carbidopa booster drug? Because fava beans may not only be a natural source of L-DOPA, but a natural source of the carbidopa booster too. So the consumption of fava beans has the potential to increase the levels of L-DOPA and carbidopa in the blood with a marked improvement in muscle movement performance of the patients with Parkinson's disease without any side effects. In fact, they work so well you have to be careful about abruptly stopping them. There's a condition called neuroleptic malignant-like syndrome, characterized by fever, rigidity, all sorts of neurological problems, muscle breakdown, altered levels of consciousness, which is usually precipitated by an abrupt withdrawal of the L-DOPA drug caused by an acute dopamine-deficient state. Well, you can see the same thing if you're treating your Parkinson's with fava beans and then all of a sudden stop them. Ten days before hospital admission, this poor guy's garden ran out of beans, leading to a severe crippling rigidity. This case demonstrates that alternative therapies carry similar risks to traditional agents, because in this case they really are the ultimate traditional agent. There are some downsides you don't see with the drug, though, like fava-induced flatulence. You also have to be careful with fava consumption if you're on MAO inhibitor drugs, often used as antidepressants since there can be drug interactions. And then there's the risk of a condition known as favism. There's a genetic mutation that occurs in about 1 in 20 people, and at even higher rates than those of African, Asian, and Mediterranean descent, in which people lack an enzyme that's necessary to detoxify certain compounds found in fava beans. And without the enzyme, fava bean consumption can cause your red blood cells to rupture. Thankfully, genetic testing for this mutation is widely available and affordable, 
So it seemed prudent to screen patients with Parkinson's for this favaism, what's called G6PD deficiency, mutation, uh, prior to putting them on daily fava bean consumption. If you want to give fava beans a try, fresh green fava beans have significantly more L-dopa than dried, so much so that dried fava beans may not provide any clinical benefits. Roasting and boiling remove some or even all of the L-dopa, though other studies have found about a half cup of cooked favas contain approximately 250 mg. Sprouted favas may have the most, increasing up until day 9, by which time the indigestible flatulent sugars may be eliminated, offering another advantage of fava bean sprouting. But you don't know if fava bean sprouts help until you put them to the test. Researchers fed Parkinson's patients a salad with about a half cup of freshly chopped fava sprouts and observed substantial clinical improvement. Other beans, just like regular beans, also naturally have L-dopa, though at lower amounts. Uh, soybeans have a bonus compound that may act as an L-dopa-boosting carbidopa compound. Uh, what if you fed people soybeans on top of their regular Parkinson's meds? Giving people just one and a half spoonfuls worth of roasted soybeans led to a significant improvement over the drugs alone, with significantly fewer involuntary movements hours later. Until more information is available, Parkinson's combo drugs like Cinnamet should remain the first-line therapy, but adding beans to one's diet may only help. Fibromyalgia is a common disorder whose cardinal manifestation is chronic, widespread pain. Well, not so common, affecting 2 to 4% of the population, though probably more like 2%, uh, and especially women. For decades, some medical professionals dismissed fibromyalgia as all in people's heads, but this outdated view has been refuted by more recent research characterizing it as a disorder of pain regulation and sensitization. Brain imaging studies have shown several perturbations of pain processing and regulation that amplify pain in people with a condition. Twin studies have shown that about half of fibromyalgia is genetic, but the other half we can do something about. There are lots of drugs with lots of side effects to help with some of the symptoms, but what about lifestyle approaches? Engagement in regular physical activity is considered imperative for effective management of fibromyalgia. A systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized clinical trials on the effectiveness of therapeutic exercise in fibromyalgia found that both aerobic and resistance exercises are effective ways of reducing pain and improving global well-being in people with fibromyalgia. Patients may worry and perceive that exercise will worsen their pain and fatigue, and so you have to start slow and work your way up as tolerated, with the goal of eventually achieving 30 to 60 minutes of moderate-intensity aerobic exercise in addition to muscle-strengthening exercises, one to three sets of 8 to 11 exercises, 8 to 10 repetitions with a load of about 7 pounds, or 45% of the max you can lift. But what about dietary interventions in terms of dialing down the pain sensitivity? Well, what causes it in the first place? Inflammation. During the inflammatory response, pain receptors are activated, and chronic inflammation can cause chronic activation, which may cause chronic pain due to this prolonged hypersensitization of pain pathways. No wonder, then, that a pro-inflammatory diet was found to be associated with pain hypersensitivity in patients with fibromyalgia syndrome. Exactly which foods are pro-inflammatory and which foods are anti-inflammatory? Check out those twin videos. But broadly speaking, components of processed foods and animal products such as saturated fat, trans fat, and cholesterol were found to be pro-inflammatory, while constituents of whole plant foods such as fiber and phytonutrients were strongly anti inflammatory. The intake of dietary fiber found concentrated in only one place, whole plant foods, is fundamental to reducing not only the risk of abdominal pain, but also muscle and joint pain, we think because of these short-chain fatty acids that our good gut bugs produce when we eat fiber. These short-chain fatty acids are important mediators of pain, fundamentally because they modulate inflammation. So having lots of fiber-feeding bugs in your colon is like carrying around your own anti-inflammatory compound factory. But to cultivate them, you actually have to eat the foods that feed them. In terms of phytonutrients, 
Plant-derived polyphenols are widely acknowledged to also act as anti-inflammatory substances. Here's some foods packed with anti-pain pathway nutrients, berries, greens, citrus, nuts, spices like turmeric and ginger, edamame, and green tea. That's why you can do randomized, double-blind, crossover trials showing that about three cups worth of strawberries a day can significantly improve pain and inflammation. If that's what a single plant can do, what about a diet chock full of plant foods? Put people on a strictly plant-based diet rich in fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and various legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, as well as nuts and seeds, and you can drop C-reactive protein levels 33% in three weeks, which is a leading blood marker of systemic inflammation. But does that translate into less pain? And the answer is yes when it comes to migraine headaches, yes when it comes to painful periods, a significant reduction in menstrual pain duration and pain intensity, in addition to premenstrual symptoms. In fact, even just a single plant, cinnamon, about a third of a teaspoon three times a day during your period, can help, though it doesn't work as well as ibuprofen. Ginger powder, on the other hand, ground ginger, has been found to be comparable to ibuprofen in relieving pain in women with painful cramps. You can learn more in my video on the topic. Whole food plant-based diets also alleviate the symptoms of osteoarthritis. Several studies have shown improvements in rheumatoid arthritis symptoms with diets excluding animal products, though it may be just as much a function of increasing the quantity of healthy plant foods. But it's not just because plant-based diets are so effective in causing weight loss. Even at the same weight, there's an improvement in rheumatoid arthritis from more plant-based diets. And plant-based diets can also alleviate fibromyalgia symptoms. This is the latest study, which enrolled anyone with chronic musculoskeletal pain, fibromyalgia or not. Yes, diets high in animal proteins and fats have been linked to chronic pain and inflammation, while plant-based diets produce anti-inflammatory responses. So did it actually work when put to the test for pain? Yes. Consumption of a plant-based diet produced positive improvements in chronic pain and function. How much? Well, a minimally clinically important difference in chronic musculoskeletal pain is one point on the numeric pain rating scale, which is just a scale of 1 to 10 on how much pain you're feeling. And on the plant-based diet, perceived pain decreased an average of 3 points on a 10-point scale, from an average of 5 or 6 out of 10 down to 2. Now, unlike most of the prior studies, there was no control group, but what's the downside of giving healthier eating a try? In fact, those with chronic pain are more likely to be overweight and have nutrition-related maladies such as you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart disease, all of which can be prevented, arrested, and in some cases even reversed with a healthy enough plant-based diet. So any pain benefit is just icing on the cake of health. Uh, scratch that. H how about the dollop of guacamole on your bean burrito? Population studies have found short sleep duration has been associated with obesity in both children and adults. Observational studies can never prove cause and effect, though. Maybe the obesity is leading to sleep loss instead of the other way around. Obesity can cause arthritis, acid reflux, and apnea, all of which can interfere with sleep. The relationship between obesity and sleep apnea, where your breathing repeatedly stops and starts throughout the night, may be explained by increased tongue fat, fat deposited inside the base of the tongue that may contribute to obstructing your airway when you sleep on your back. The reverse causation explanation of the link between obesity and inadequate sleep is bolstered by the finding that weight loss interventions can improve daytime sleepiness. Potential confounding factors also abound. For example, people with lower socioeconomic status often work less desirable hours, such as rotating or overnight shifts, or may live in noisier neighborhoods with poorer air quality, more crime. The link between inadequate sleep and obesity persists after controlling for these kinds of factors, but you can't control for everything. You can't know for sure if sleep deprivation leads to weight gain until you put it to the test. Have people pull an all-nighter and they get hungrier and choose larger portions? Randomize people to shave even just a few hours of sleep off every night, and they start eating an average of 677 calories more a day compared to the normal sleep control group. Although individual responses vary widely, anywhere from eating 813 calories less per day to as many as 1,437 calories more, on average, 
Studies found sleep deprivation led people to overeat by about 180 to 560 calories a day. Restrict people's sleep, and they also start craving unhealthier choices— more snacks, more foods that are fatty and sugary. Stick people in a brain scanner after staying awake all night or after a few nights of four-hour sleep, and their reward pathways light up brighter in response to high-calorie foods. Sleep deprivation bumps the levels of the chief endocannabinoid in the body, the natural chemical we synthesize that binds to the same receptors as the active ingredient in marijuana. This may help explain the nighttime nibbling. On the calories outside of the equation, some short sleepers may take the extra time to exercise. Others will be so sleepy they exercise less. The extra wakefulness may raise calorie expenditure up to about 100 calories a day, but if sleep-deprived individuals are overeating hundreds of calories, over time sleep deprivation may end up putting the wide in wide awake. With insufficient sleep inadvertently leading to such higher calorie intake, it's no surprise that four out of five studies involving as few as two to five nights of sleep restriction found an increase in body weight. In other words, if you sleep less, you may gain more. OK, but here's where it gets crazy. Even if you control calorie intake, you still lose more fat when you get more sleep. Overweight subjects, who normally got between 6.5 to 8.5 hours of sleep a night, were randomized to two weeks of either 8.5 hours of sleep a night or 5.5 hours of sleep on the same calorie-controlled diet. Then the group switched and spent another two weeks in the opposite regimen, so they spent a month living in a lab so their diets and sleep could be totally controlled and monitored. And just looking at the scales, sleep duration didn't seem to matter. During both periods, they ate the same number of calories and lost the same amount of weight. But most of the weight lost while getting 8.5 hours was fat, whereas most of the weight lost when only getting 5.5 hours of sleep a night was lean body mass. Same diet, but with more sleep, they ended up losing more than twice as much body fat. So you snooze, you lose fat. In my last video, I featured a study that found that curtailing sleep can cut your rate of body fat loss in half while exacerbating the loss of lean mass. To get better insight into what was going on, researchers took fat and muscle biopsies from people after a night of sleep loss. In terms of genes that were turned on and off, molecular signatures were discovered suggesting muscle breakdown and fat buildup. That was after an all-nighter, though, and in the weight loss study, the sleep-restricted groups ended up getting little more than five hours a night. What about a more realistic scenario, like sleeping just one hour less a night? Overweight adults were randomized to eight weeks of a calorie-restricted diet, or the same diet combined with just five days a week of one hour a night less sleep. The sleep-restricted group achieved the one hour a day less sleep on weekdays, but ended up sleeping an hour more on the weekend day, so overall they just cut about three hours of sleep out of their week. Would just those few hours a week make any weight loss difference? On the scale, no. But in the normal sleep group, 80% of the weight loss was fat, whereas in the group just missing a few hours of sleep a week, it was the opposite. 80% of the loss was lean. This shows that a few hours of catch-up sleep on the weekends is insufficient, and may in fact be contributing to the problem based on the social jet lag effect I explored in a previous video. A comparable study was designed for kids, but the sleeping periods only lasted a week. 8- to 11-year-olds were randomized to either increase or decrease their time in bed by 1.5 hours per night for a week, and then switch the following week. They ate an average of 134 calories more on the days they slept less, and gained in that week about half a pound compared to the sleep more week. The question then becomes, would sleeping more facilitate weight loss? When it comes to body fat, can we just sleep it off? The benefit of interventional studies is you can demonstrate cause and effect, but observational studies can allow you to more easily track people and their behaviors over a longer time span. For example, researchers followed a group of mostly overweight individuals who started out uh, averaging less than six hours of sleep a night for more than five years. During that time, about half maintained that schedule, but the other half increased their sleep duration up to seven or eight hours a night and ended up gaining five pounds less fat. A study entitled Sleeping Habits Predict the Magnitude of Fat Loss Among Those Cutting Calories 
found that every extra hour of sleep at night was associated with an extra 1.5 pounds of weight loss over a period of about three to six months. Uh, it's not the same as randomizing people to extra sleep, though. I mean, maybe they were sleeping more because they were exercising more, and that's the real reason they lost more weight. Getting people to bump their sleep from 5.5 hours up to 7 can lead to an overall decrease in appetite within two weeks, particularly for sugary and salty foods. A four-week study getting habitual short sleepers to sleep an extra hour a night led them to consume about two fewer spoonfuls of sugar a day compared to the control group, but this didn't translate into any changes in body composition. A 12-week study, on the other hand, randomized the overweight and obese individuals to a weight loss intervention with or without a sleep component found that the sleep group lost weight significantly faster. A national cross-sectional survey suggested lower obesity rates among kids in households that regularly ate dinner together as a family, got adequate sleep, and limited screen times, and so Harvard researchers decided to try to put those behaviors to the test. A six-month randomized trial to improve household routines for obesity prevention among young children resulted in a lower BMI. Normally, it's hard to tease out the effects of multi-component interventions, but in this case, exhortations to limit overall TV watching didn't work, and the families were already eating together six days a week, and so that didn't change much either. The only thing they were able to get the kids to significantly alter was their sleep, and so the improved weight outcomes may be attributed, at least in part, to the three-quarters of an hour average increase in nightly sleep. Overall, most sleep improvement interventions tended to show improved weight loss. I was intrigued to look up the one study that didn't. The nice thing about systematic reviews, as opposed to so-called narrative reviews, is that they exhaustively include mention of every study that meets some pre-specified criteria. This keeps reviewers from cherry-picking, but it can also lead to the inclusion of some strange studies. In this case, a randomized controlled trial of didgeridoo playing, the indigenous Australian wind instrument. Those randomized to the didgeridoo to improve their sleep quality did not lose any weight, but they also failed to improve the quality of their sleep, or likely that of their neighbors. The use of vinegar for weight loss dates back to the 1700s. I did a whole chapter about it in my book How Not to Diet, entitled Amping AMPK, the fat controller enzyme in the body, which appears to be the mechanism behind the multitude of beneficial metabolic effects. In my 21 tweaks to accelerate weight loss, I recommend two teaspoons with every meal, which is considered safe, though it should be added to food or diluted in water, never consumed straight. And diabetics should make sure the vinegar doesn't make their blood sugars go too low. But that's one of the benefits of vinegar, blunting the blood sugar and insulin spikes after a meal in both healthy individuals and those with blood sugar disorders like diabetes. In a systematic review and meta-analysis of interventional trials of the effects of vinegar consumption on blood sugar control and type 2 diabetes, vinegar improves both short-term and longer-term measures of blood sugar control and, as like a little side bonus, resulted in a remarkable reduction in cholesterol to boot. And it didn't seem to matter whether it was apple cider vinegar or not, all vinegar by definition has the active ingredient, acetic acid. So what are the implications for clinical practice? Well, Clinicians could incorporate vinegar consumption as part of their dietary advice for patients with diabetes, with the caution that it can work a little too good, and so you have to monitor closely to make sure diabetic patients aren't over-medicated and bottom out their sugars. In my video on water purification, I talked about this study showing that the cheapest and best way to disinfect your toothbrush, so you don't have to keep buying new ones, maybe to soak it for 10 minutes in 50% white vinegar and water. So what about a vinegar sock soak for athlete's foot or toenail fungus? Foot soaks in half vinegar, half water can help antifungals work better, but the inconvenience of tub soaks limits compliance. So how about pouring vinegar and water on the toes of your socks and then just like putting your feet up for a little while? Not sure how that would be any more convenient, but seemed to work in this clinician's practice. Instead of vinegar for just an athlete's foot, what about vinegar for the whole athlete? The effect of vinegar supplementation on high-intensity cycling performance. They randomized people to do two tablespoons of diluted vinegar, or sugar, or both, or neither, and the vinegar did nothing. Is there anything else vinegar does help with? 
The intake of a vinegar beverage is associated with restoration of ovulatory function in women with polycystic ovary syndrome. For those of you unfamiliar, PCOS, PCOS is a uh, major cause of irregular menstruation, and since insulin resistance has been suggested to be one of the causes of polycystic ovaries, and we know vinegar can improve insulin resistance, researchers decided to study the effect of vinegar by giving seven patients seeking a non-pharmacological treatment for PCOS a beverage containing a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar daily for a few months. Uh, the insulin resistance did improve in most, but did their cycles return? Yes, in four out of seven. Before the study, they were either only having their periods every 50 days or so, or none at all, or just not ovulating, but most resumed within 40 days on the vinegar. Now, this doesn't prove anything, but it's at least sufficient to indicate the possibility that it may help. And what's the downside? A tablespoon of vinegar would cost less than 10 cents a day. Just remember, never drink vinegar straight, as it can cause second-degree caustic burns down your throat.